one we've been talking the whole time right okay so here it is we've been in the series we call it action because faith has what hey yes 10 weeks we got there faith has feet i hope that you've been reading through because we're going to look at the very end of james james chapter 5 19 and 20 we're going to be there at the very end of this letter and this entire letter has been about putting feet to your faith and james it's a very interesting letter because in the last chapter of james chapter 5 it ends differently than other early church letters so if you read so the new testament of your bible uh, there's a chunk of it that are, they're called epistles which are essentially letters written by early church fathers men like paul uh, disciples like john you, uh, peter there are letters written to different churches in different areas are you tracking and some of them and, and it's it's no different than james in the uh, essence of it's a letter written to a group of Christians somewhere in this particular case scattered in different non-Christian communities as James teaches them and in, with instruction to put feet to their faith but every letter that is written in the New Testament to these New Testament early churches it always starts with a greeting and then a, a farewell greeting do, do you know what I'm saying like you get that email I hope this email finds you well right and then at the end it's you know sincerely or god bless or have a great day or you know, happy thanksgiving whatever you know you, you get that farewell greeting james doesn't do that it's very odd if you think of it like that and a lot of us we don't read our bible like that because we read our bible uh, almost in a robotic way where we just kind of read the words and don't consider the personal connection to things but when you understand that these letters from early church fathers had personal fare farewell greetings and then you read the end of James, you would maybe think for a moment, hold on, what's missing here? So you'll have Paul sometimes would write at the end, you know, I, Paul, write this in my own hand and pray for so-and-so because he would have someone who would kind of dictate his letters and stuff. Peter would even at the end, hey, I want to make sure that I, I toss out this kind of almost benediction type of salutation at the very back end of the letter. James doesn't do that. James just ends with some pretty heavy just eternity weight bearing instruction and then just hangs up you guys have that person in your life who like awkwardly ends conversations you know what i'm talking about maybe it's you maybe you're the person who awkwardly ends conversations because you just don't know how especially nowadays everybody's so comfortable with texting that even just answering the phone generates a level of anxiety for most people and so to get off the phone you're like oh man i picked it up now i know i gotta end it i gotta do both parts of this you have that and you're just like all right so that's what we're gonna do next week all right uh, uh. and then maybe you're just that person like well click and you just get out of there and you're like, I don't, man, I'm sure that was rude. The person calls you back. Did you just hang up on me? No, I just don't know how to do this. I don't know how to end this conversation. Sometimes you have those people that in person, I have people like that in my life. Uh, I'm not going to dog them out, but some of them serve here um, in our church who you will have a conversation with them and they'll finish talking with you and they're like, and you're just, and other people are around, and they're like, did that person just straight up walk away from you? You're like, yeah, they do that. That's how they end conversations. It's uncomfortable for them. They don't know how to transition well. There's no goodbye. <laughs> I mean, it's so easy, but we don't, we don't do it. James does that here, and it's really fascinating to me because what he's going to say is so powerful, and he just leaves it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go there in your phones, pull there in your Bible, James 5, 19. We'll have it on the screen, and we're going to do this again. We've done this a little bit recently. I want to all read it together. So look on the screen again, to be clear. Look on the screen when we read it together so nobody's confused by the words. We're going to read this in James 5, 19 through 20, he final verses of this letter. This is what he says. My dear brothers and sisters, family, if someone among you wanders away from the truth, and is brought back you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins boom done no farewell greeting just family if any of you wanders and is brought back be sure that is life 
savings. Here's what we're going to look at. He uses a word here, and I've titled this because it's an old folk song, and that's just how I am. I've titled this conversation, Never Did No Wandering. But maybe, maybe you've done this because you are familiar with this word. He says, if any of you wanders. You ever wandered? Yeah, we wander, right? We just do. It's easy to wander. And I read this, and initially what you think, and it, tell me if you did this, right, not out loud, but just tell me in your own mind. Have a conversation with me in your head while I talk. If you did this, uh, maybe you read this, and the very first thing that you took out from this is, oh, it'll save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. You know why you probably went there? Because most people skip to the results side. They, they skip over the work side. And you're like, wait a minute, what? Okay, hear me out. Most of us hear these verses and we skip right to the result of bringing people back instead of the responsibility to bring people back. And what does he say? He says, no, out the gate in this last little couplet as he finalizes this letter. My dear, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back. You know what I first thought? I thought, man, why do I wander sometimes? Do I wander? Do you wander? And I thought, what makes people wander away from the truth as I, I spend time thinking about our church and and just the christian community the, the church of god I, I think what like what makes people wander off from the truth because at some point we've we've decided to commit ourselves to following jesus if you claim to be a christian you have said i believe the truth of the gospel the good news that god is god i'm not i can't get to god on my own so god got to me through the person of jesus and the salvation that he provides through giving his life as a ransom so it could make a way for me to have relationship with god we hold on to that truth and then we hold on to the truth of the teachings of jesus the commandments of god that even other disciples would say if you love god you will what keep his commandments those truths that we hold on to that we put feet to how do we wander from that and i thought about it so i wrote some down and i thought all right there's some there's some reasons why we wander i think one of the reasons we wander is we define our own truth that's a very popular thing in we assume modern society but can i tell you it was it was popular thousands of years ago you hear the phrase live your truth well if it's true for you there's a word we used to use in the 80s and 90s as a term. We called it moral relativism. What's right for you is right for you. It may not be right for someone else, but if all things are true, then how can anything be true? So what do we do? We revolve our truth around our feelings, and so it eliminates any form of anchor in our lives, and so we start to just start to wander. And it's an interesting word because this word wander, you know what it actually means? It means to stray. It's two layered. It's interesting. It means to, to stray or to be misled. Meaning that if we're leading ourselves, we will stray. And it was a word that Jesus used in the New Testament to essentially talk about shepherds who would oversee and manage livestock, sheep and, and other livestock. And here's what would happen. They'd be responsible for large groups of them, herds of these livestock. And what would happen is every now and then, one of the sheep, one of the goats, one of the, the, the you know, uh, livestock members would just kind of start, you know, going off on its own and, and wander. And the shepherd would have to go track it down and, and bring it back. And it wasn't that it was just trying to escape necessarily. It just didn't know any better. And it just moved away from the anchor that was the herd, the group, and just kind of drifted in its own. But the shepherd knew something about it. The shepherd knew that if the sheep or if the, the goat or whatever member of livestock was there, if it wandered too far away, it was susceptible to danger. There would be things like mountain lions or coyotes or wolves or, or something of that nature that would threaten it. And so why, why do we wander sometimes? We define our own truth. And the further we get from the truth of God and start to define our own truth, the more confused we get. You ever been there? You ever known people in your life that are, are like that? We also, why do we wander? We listen to the wrong voices. What voices do we listen to? Man, in church, can I tell you, this happens a lot. Maybe somebody gets angry about something and they say, I don't want anything to do with this place or these people anymore. And so they, they leave and they start to spread that vitriol and that voice gets 
heard and we're susceptible to that voices and instead of edifying the body of Christ we start to tear it down by listening to voices that tear it down and oh even on the internet you know somebody says something negative about God's church and we think oh yeah that's right Christians are like that instead of saying no no no, how can I not be like that how can I be a light instead of cursing a, a darkness or maybe maybe listening to certain voices that we we subscribe to certain podcasts that say okay look I understand the Jesus thing but have you considered this and you think oh well maybe that you know maybe maybe you know that, that you can play it fast and loose with the truth of of Jesus and we listen to different voices what voices influence you matter and then eventually you start to kind of wander here's one that I think is really really subtle but really effective one of the reasons we wander is we get distracted I thought about it and it's an old Baptist preacher phrase if the devil can't change your mind he'll change your schedule if he can't change your mind he'll make you busy enough to distract you from the disciplines of the Jesus filled life so the priorities that God sets out in your relationship with him get put on the back burner not because you're attempting to move them to a lower slot on the priority list of life but because life just gets too busy I'm a little distracted and so if the devil can't change your mind he'll change your schedule and we've got this going on and I've got this coming up in life and before you know it when was the last time you spent time with God in prayer or in his word or worshiping with God's people and the priority of your relational pursuit of God with your faith in Jesus doesn't wander because you maliciously wanted to put it to the back burner it's just because you got too busy and you didn't discipline yourself it is indeed that a discipline and we wander without that that discipline we surround ourselves with people who don't speak truth to us or love us enough to call us out on things or to hold us accountable to things can I tell you church if all of the people in your life are echo chambers of everything you say you should probably find some new people in your life who will hold you accountable the very best friends I want you to hear this maybe even write it down the very best friends never let you settle for less than God's best those are the very best friends sometimes the words they speak may hurt a little bit but they will help more than they hurt the last one I thought that I when I considered why we wander is I considered the most I think subtle form of wandering that I think exists and I think it's this I think we wander with our attitude I tell my kids all the time attitude and effort are two of the most important things to consider in life your attitude determines so much of your direction I would say it like this on brand with our action series your feet are a reflection of your attitude because how you see things how you approach things depends on how you you move in that direction well what happens with attitude attitude is often a slow boil it simmers you ever done uh, any cooking or, or anything and it's it's low and slow you you crock pot something and you just leave it some of you maybe even doing it right now it's at home and you're just waiting after church and you've crocked about it. it's low and slow it just it simmers doesn't it attitude kind of kind of just just simmers and that's what'll happen what'll happen is you'll have a negative attitude about something and no one loves you enough to call you out on it and maybe encourage you to see things differently and approach things differently so it slides and so that attitude just starts to kind of simmer in the negativity Maybe you gossip with someone or somebody gossips to you and, and no one loves each other enough or has the courage enough to say, hey, 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 instead of talking about someone, maybe we should go talk, you know, with someone the way God, God tells us to. And so what our attitude does is our attitude just kind of feeds into that and before you know it, we just kind of let it, let it simmer. And it's a slow boil of our attitude in the direction of things that don't honor 
God, maybe the words that we say, the approach that we have, the things we say about other people. And nobody checks those because we're all afraid to love people enough to call that out and have that conversation. And so it allows our attitude and we get away with it. So it kind of checks. You know what happens? Our attitude, we get so busy, right? The devil can't change our mind, so he changes our schedule. You know what our attitude does? Our attitude says, I'm a little too tired to go to church, so maybe I'll just skip this week. Or I, I got a lot of stuff going on. And so, okay, you know, maybe I'll catch him in a few weeks. And and maybe it's, it becomes less. And, and our attitude, it's not malicious. We love church. We want to be with God's people. But because our attitude just slowly simmers in the direction, we end up treating church as an add-on to our week instead of a launch pad for our week. And we don't do it on purpose. Our attitude just starts to simmer. And what happens? We wander. Because we're being led by ourselves and we're being misled in a way and it's so important but the reason it's so important is because it was dangerous you got to remember Jesus uses this word wander to describe sheep and and goats and livestock wandering off why did the shepherd have to go chase them down because it was dangerous for them when they wandered off because it's dangerous for both the wanderer and those affected by the wandering because if one sheep would wander off then what happens is another sheep's over here and they kind of look up and say oh that one's going that way well then maybe I'll go maybe I'll go that way and James knew this so he writes this so sincerely because the church understood something and it's really powerful it is really powerful here's what the church understood the church understood that all that matters is God and people and people are worth going after and it is dangerous for you if you drift away and wander off from the truth of God. There is absolutely nothing that will hold you like an anchor fast in a world that is always seemingly upside down, defining its own truth, utterly in chaos, in divisive despair, seemingly every other time you turn around, evil exists, real hardships exist, Love, peace, joy, all of those things that are rooted in the truth of God, only that is the anchor. And so if we wander and wander and wander, the distance between us and our anchor gets so far that eventually it's really hard to find our way back. And you start to feel lost. When I was in high school, uh, my friend took me skiing. And I had never been skiing, uh, didn't know how to ski, didn't know any of it, but they loved skiing, specifically snowboarding. And so he took me up this mountain an hour and a half away from where we lived called Winter Green, and we, uh, we went skiing. Now, I don't own skis. I owned a jacket, and uh, that was enough because they let you rent skis. And if you've ever been to a ski resort, they'll, they'll let you do all that stuff. And so we get up there and my buddy he was a, a snowboarder he was really into it and he said okay well you just do whatever you want to do because you know when you're in high school your friends they they help you to a point uh, and that point is would you like to come with yeah and then when you get there they're like you're good I was not good um, I got there and I went to the pro shop and I said hey I, I'm new I need to rent some skis and they said yeah man this is your first time and I was like nah yeah. Can I just give you some pro tips? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. And they give me some skis, and the guy, I think the guy could tell. He was like, are you sure, man? He goes, because we have a ski school. And he said, for $35, you can take an hour ski lesson, and, and they'll teach you everything so that you can know how to do it. And I thought, $35? You're crazy. I'll just watch from a distance and figure it out. So that's what I did. I watched from a distance. And you know what I figured out? Nothing. I figured out nothing. And I got on those skis. And I, I, and there's the, the, they call it the bunny hill. And it's the real easy one. It's not easy. I don't know why they say that. It's mean and insulting that they say that. Because if you have no idea what you are doing, you're going to feel like an absolute moron. And you're going to be a threat to others, as I found myself being that evening as we were at Wintergreen Ski Resort. And so I looked in my haughtiness and in my pride and my ego, no, nah, I don't need to learn how to ski. And I watched them, and I was like, oh, it's pretty easy. You just take the skis, 
point them in the direction you want to go, kind of squat down a little bit, you'll head in that direction, great, this is easy. It planes out at the bottom, boom. I know how gravity works, it's just gonna eventually slow me down. The problem is, is I uh, weighed about 235 pounds, and you know, the, the heavier you are, the, the, more, the more distance it takes for you to just naturally stop. Are you aware of this? A little scientific lesson for everyone. So I took off on these skis, and I started realizing, oh man, you know what I should have asked? I should have asked, how do you stop? And I didn't ask. And so I'm coming to the end of the, the slope, and there's the ski lift. You know what I'm talking about? The ski lift's the best part about a ski resort, is you get to ride that big chair lift up the hill so you don't have to walk all the way. It's great. And there's a whole big line of people in the ski lift, and I realized that's the destination. No breaks, no breaks, destination whole big line of people and I'm just at this point I'm yelling at them because I know I know I can't stop so I'm yelling at them I can't stop I can't stop and now here's the deal when you're outside it's a big nobody can understand what you're saying all those people knew was some kid is yelling at them while he's going down the hill and I I got desperate and I figured okay God here's what happens I either smack into the building that is the ski lift or I humble myself in front of all these people and I just throw myself at the mercy of the mountain. So I did, and I kicked my feet up, and I cannonballed into that snow. But here's the, the deal. I didn't cannonball as much as I bowling balled, and I legitimately wiped out every single person in that line. It was so bad, one lady hit me with one of her poles. And I'm not making that up. She legitimately got so mad that she hit me with one of her poles. I apologized, I rode the ski lift by myself. No one wants to ride with that guy. And I got to the top and I decided, okay, well that one's right in the middle, that's got everybody. And I figured, well, here's the deal. Everybody's on this ski slope. You know what I'll do? I don't wanna be a danger to anybody. There's one on the right side that nobody seems to be going down. I'll go down that one so I'm not risking anybody else and so I did that one. It was later described to me something with a diamond in it. I don't know anything about skiing, but I'll tell you what I did know. It went downhill really fast, and I mean physically downhill and metaphorically downhill very, very fast. Before you knew it, I didn't know what I was doing. I had fallen over so many times. I took my skis off, carried them, and I'm just at this point walking in the woods. I'm in the mountains of Appalachia in central Virginia, pouring down snow, freezing, walking in the woods with jeans and a, a jacket on. No clue what I'm doing. Completely lost. And I walked for what may have been an hour or two. I just kept, and I didn't know where to go. I just knew if I keep walking up the hill, I'll probably eventually get there. So I just, whoo, whoo and just chugging, and it got to the point where I started seeing, you know how they have lights at the ski resort? Uh, they, they, were going, they were poof, poof, they were turning off. And I knew in that moment, this is not good. I know enough to know this is not good. This may be my first time here, but when they start turning the lights off, that's bad, that is a bad sign. And I had that moment, I just thought, well, mom, I love you, it was great seeing you the last time I saw you, I live here now. I live in the woods <laughs> at Wintergreen. And as I start to get really worried, I look over the crest of the hill, and there comes a guy on a snowmobile. You ever seen those things? A snow, and he comes and he, he gets to, he sees me and he goes, are you Scott Smith? I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, your party's been looking for you for hours. I didn't know what to say. I was like, I don't know how to ski. He goes, you think? He puts me on the back of his ski mobile, we come up, and my friends were so mad at me for two reasons. One, I made them wait, and two, they had been skiing for years and never got to ride a ski mobile, and I got to ride one my first time. <laughs> now that's a goofy story, but the reason I share it is this. I didn't set out to get lost in the woods. I wandered off, and before you knew it, I was in a dangerous place, and what happened? I needed to get brought back. I needed to get brought back. Church, I'm gonna say some things that are serious and I want you to hear me. And I want you to hear me with, 
humility, but also not my authority, the authority that comes from this library of books inspired by God we call the book, the Bible. These words of the brother of Jesus when he says to bring them back. Here's what usually happens in churches. People wander off and we don't pay any attention to it until it's too late. And before you know it, people who have been wandering are so far that now we realize, where are they? What happened to them? Are they okay? And then we start asking questions. Well, wh how did they? What? What? Oh, no. And then what do we do? We, as the church goers, as church members, we say, well, the church should do something about it. The church should do something about people wandering off. The church should have more programs so people will, will, will have a reason and an excuse to walk in the door. And James says, you're right, the church should do something about it, but not through programs, through people. James says, you're absolutely right, the church should do something about it. You know what the church should do? The church should go after people when they wander. He says, because if you bring them back, it is life-giving. You know, our mission as a church is to help people know and follow Jesus. I want you to notice something very important here, though. Our mission is not to hope that people know and follow Jesus. Our mission is to help people know and follow Jesus. What do we do? I hope God reaches them. I hope somebody in their life reaches out to them. I hope God convicts them. I hope God brings them back. Church, can I tell you, there is absolutely nothing wrong with hope. But your hope better have feet. Because our mission is to help people know and follow Jesus. Hope without help. That's just good intentions. I think a lot of people are exercising what I call helpless hope. In the church, we have a lot of practitioners of helpless hope. It's a hope that doesn't help because hope is not a strategy. Hope without feet, hope without help is just good intentions. But good intentions never take you anywhere unless you implement those intentions to go after people. What does he say? When someone wanders from the truth, you bring them back. You can hope all you want to, but if you don't help, it's not going to go anywhere because the smallest step of obedience goes further than the greatest of intentions every time. So the church should do something about it, as James Wright, yes, we should. We should. Is there anyone in our lives who are, are wandering off? This is so profound, it is so serious, and the reason it's so serious is because James understood something that we just, we forget in our modern American Christian church thinking. What does he say? You can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Do you know what he's pressing upon people here? This of utmost importance that people are lost without Jesus. And we say that in church and nobody bats an eye. People are lost without Jesus. And James knew the church looked different back then. I'm about to kind of go off for a moment, so buckle up. The church looked different. We're going to talk more about this in January as we look at the values that we believe God wants and has for his church. But when I talk about the early church, the early church meant business. When they believed people would spend eternity somewhere, they believed people would spend eternity somewhere. A lot of our American Christian churches nowadays look more like casual coalitions of church goers who just have demands that as long as it's like this, they do this, they do this kind of music, they got this kind of program, and I got this kind of parking, then I'll go be a part of your thing. And no one wanted to, to, to escape 
two realities that we, as kind of modern American churchgoers, don't seem to want to interact with too much. And it was, A, the spiritual authority of the Word of God to propel us to obey God in all seasons and all situations, or B, the spiritual responsibility we have as Christ followers who say, Jesus, I am yours, and you're the only eligible hope I have, so I want others to know that hope, that love, that only comes from you, God, through the message of salvation, the gospel of Jesus. So what do we do? We check a box, but we don't go after people. I told you I was coming at it. You know why? Because it's dangerous when people wander. Do you love the wanderer enough to bring them back? So what do we do with that? Because we have to get practical. I can't just say these things and think, man, he just, there you go. There's a flamethrower of biblical truth for everybody. So what do we do if we are going to, pun intended, put feet to our faith? How do we lace up our shoes with this? How do we, how do we, bring people back how do we do that it's going to require two things and you're going to see them in this passage it will require if we if we are going to bring people back who wander it's going to require these two things love and truth now i want you to look at a key word here and it's not the word you're thinking the word is and see these two words don't get used often a lot they're not popularly used uh, in in conjunction with each other right we don't we don't tend to do that why because we say no 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 no. all we need to do is is love people all people need is love that's all that's all people need or we take the opposite side and we say no 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 doesn't matter how you feel or, or, or whatever. I'm sure I care about you because it's strategic to care about you, but all I really care about is the truth. And so we, we, we tend to kind of uh, almost, you know, kind of play, you know, double Dutch, uh, you know, jump rope here, and we just oscillate truth, love. I'm going I'm, I'm to do the truth thing. Okay, well, I'm going to do the love thing. And what do we do? What do we do? We end up separating the two, and that is not what you see. What does he say? What does he say? My dear brother, family. If someone among you, with you, wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Do you know what he shows us right there? He shows us love and truth. You will never go after someone unless you love them, but you have nothing to bring them back to unless there's a truth to bring them back to. You notice that he says wanders from the truth we have misunderstood the relationship between love and truth because we've adopted a perspective that says just love people and they'll be okay but love has to stand on something for it to have any power doesn't it for the Christian Love is defined by God, so it stands on the truth of God. But we have assumed that love and truth are mutually exclusive. That is not how it works. They actually work together. It's how we deliver them that matters as God's people when people wander to bring them back we have to have a truth to bring them back to but a love that propels us to go after them so the way we deliver love and truth matters because here's what will happen truth will become hard if it's not softened by love but love will become weak if it's not strengthened by truth See, they both work together. You know this if you have kids. What do you tell your kids? Don't do this. Why? Because this would work out poorly for you. Well, why do you want them to avoid potentially harmful consequences? Why? Because you what? Love them. And because you love them, you tell them the truth about the potential 
for those consequences. See, the way we deliver it matters, and they work together. Love and truth. The love of God stands on the truth of God, and the truth of God is rooted in the love of God. They work together. For God so loved the world that he gave. That is a truth in love. And that's the relationship that James says we need to have with these two virtues when bringing people back. Because the way we approach people matters. And how we bring people back matters. See, our mission when going after people, again, you need to hear this. This is so serious. There are people not here now who have wandered. There are people who have wandered who've never even been here. We have to consider both, don't we? Not just those who have been in the fellowship of believers, but those who are not here yet who are wandering from the truth. And it matters so much to God that he would send his only son to make a way. And it mattered so much to the early church that they would pen letter after letter after letter, exhorting the church to do something about it. When you wander, it's dangerous. There is a threat to getting lost in the woods. So the way we approach matters. Our mission is not to go after people so we can tell them how wrong they were for wandering off in the first place. But equally, our mission is not to go after people and say, well, if the decisions you're making make you feel better and you're happy, then that's all I want. I just want you to be happy. No, our mission is to go after people with love and truth. They are not mutually exclusive. They both work together. If we don't have love for people, we will never chase after them when they wander off. But if we don't have a truth to bring them back to, there's nothing to bring them back to. So I'm going to ask you this question. Because there are new days ahead for God's church. We've made that very clear. I told you in January, we're going to be having that conversation. But let's go ahead and just start the crock pot now for a conversation in a few months. Can I ask you this question? Are you willing to hop on that snowmobile and chase people down? Because eternity hangs in the balance for every human soul. And people matter to God so much that he gave everything. So when someone wanders, do you love them enough to go after them and bring them back to the truth? Are you willing to hop on that snowmobile and go after people? How do we do that? There's some practical ways, and I want to give them to you. I want to give them to you because it's a core value for the church. Here it is. You know what the core value is for the church? I'm going to slide this back so everybody can read this because it's too big for people to not see. Here it is. Here is the core value for any church. Forgive my poor handwriting skills. Overlook it to see the power of the words. Found people find people. Found people hop on that snowmobile and they chase people down. So how do you do that? Here's some ways to chase people down this week. You're going to say, great, give us some things to lace up our shoes with in a few months. Nope, I'm going to give you some four Mondays here. F-O-R Mondays for tomorrow. Maybe be an overachiever. Maybe do them today. Find someone in your life who needs to be brought back or brought in perhaps for the first time. There are people in your mind right now who you haven't seen in a while and you want to see again. There are people in your mind right now who don't know Jesus and you want them to know Jesus. So I would ask you this question. Are you willing to love them enough to do something about it? And are you willing to put your truth and love backpack on and hop on that snowmobile? Here it is. Reach out to them. Man, that's simple. Just check on them. That's a text message. That's a phone call. That's an email. Just reach out. Never underestimate what God can do with the smallest step of obedience, the smallest exercise of love. Just don't sell it short. Find somebody this week you can reach out to. Find somebody this week you can invite to church. 
It's funny, I talk to people all the time. Ah, Scott, I just don't have the gift of evangelism. Great, you know what you do have? The ability to invite somebody to church. Congratulations, you just opened the gift of evangelism. Way to go. Now everybody knows we all have a gift. Serve somebody this week. Go out of your way to serve somebody this week. Pray for somebody this week. And I'm going to give you an assignment with prayer. Don't just pray. Don't just pray. Shoot them a message and tell them, hey, I prayed for you. How else can I pray for you? Don't underestimate what that could do. Because people will wander. And in the end, all that matters is God and people. And when people wander, it is up to us to bring them back. There is no plan B. Plan A is God's church to shine the light of the love of his gospel to the world. So when people wander and they get lost in the woods, get on that snowmobile and chase them down. How will you do that this week? Because church, I will tell you this. It's what I know because I read it. It's in this big old group of books called the Bible. You know what happens? When God's people jump on that snowmobile, people hear the love and truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what happens? Lives are changed and the kingdom of God is multiplied. Do you love God and people enough to hop on the snowmobile? Get on it this week and watch what God does. I'm going to pray. We'll sing and we'll wrap things up. God, thank you again for today. It's a blessing. Thank you for the love and the truth that we get to stand on as Christians, God. That because you loved us first, we know what love is. And we hold to that truth that your way is the way, even when we want to get in the way. So God, I start this kind of concluding prayer with thanksgiving. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us purpose. Because it's, it's an unmentioned thing in those last couple of verses in James, God, but it's purpose. <laughs> it means that our lives are, are so much bigger than just ourselves so that we get to be a part of this church, this body of Christ. Even as we prayed earlier as, as, as a volunteer team, God, hearing just the passion to be a light as your family. And God, we want to be an open door family. We want to be a family that loves enough to chase people down. God, I pray that my words didn't distract. I pray that my words got out of the way, that your words are what penetrate and transform. I pray that the words that we heard today would not just stay here in these chairs when we get up and walk out the door. God, I pray that we take them with us. And God, I pray specifically as almost we kind of joke about it, God, I pray that you give all of us the love and the truth, the relationship with both of those, the love in us to hop on the snowmobile and the truth in us to root to so that when we chase people down with that love, we know exactly what we're bringing them back to and that is hope in you, God. So God, put us on those snowmobiles this week as we give this time back to you in worship and we worship you in spirit and in truth because you first loved us. So God, receive it back as we give it back. It's in your name we pray.